If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Hello, friends. We would like to talk over with you some of the promises of God which relate to the hope of life beyond the grave promises which pertain to the restoration of life in the resurrection. With me to participate in this discussion are Mr. Norman Woodworth, associate editor of the Dawn Magazine, and Mr. Edward Fay, Bible scholar and international lecturer, and Mr. Russell Pollock, our moderator. A little later, we will have the Apostle Paul and the Bible historian Luke tell us some of the wonderful ways in which the Lord led and blessed them in their ministry of the gospel of Christ. Mr. Woodworth, would you like to explain why we think it will be helpful to have Paul and Luke join us in our discussion concerning the restoration of the dead to life? Well, the Apostle Paul is uh, one of the New Testament's chief advocates of the teaching that the uh, dead are to be restored to life. He not only wrote about this in his epistles, but in most instances, in uh, bearing witness to the gospel, he stressed his belief in the resurrection or the restoration of life. Uh, Luke, of course, was the uh, historian in the early church. As I recall, a considerable portion of the book of Acts written by Luke is devoted to the experiences of the Apostle Paul. That's right, Russell. Uh, Luke recorded the dramatic conversion of Paul on the Damascus Road, which was somewhere in the vicinity of this ancient city of Damascus. Luke also recorded Paul's three missionary journeys and his visit to Athens, where on Mars Hill he preached to the Athenians the hope of life after death through Christ. Luke records Paul's experiences in appearing before kings and testifying the gospel to them. There was his appearance before Felix, and also the opportunity he enjoyed of testifying before Agrippa. Then there was his subsequent journey to Rome and his imprisonment there. Isn't it true that the Apostle Paul was warned by his friends against going to Jerusalem? He was told that bonds and imprisonment awaited him there. Uh, yes, but uh, Paul believed that it was uh, the Lord's will for him to visit Jerusalem on this particular occasion. So he explained to his friends and fellow workers in the gospel that if need be, uh, he was willing to die at Jerusalem in the service of his master, the Lord Jesus. So Paul went to Jerusalem. He visited the temple, and there his enemies, the same group really that brought about the death of Jesus, seized upon him and would have killed him had he not been rescued by Roman soldiers acting under instructions from their chief captain. And is it not true that throughout the course of his ministry, the Apostle Paul had many narrow escapes from death at the hands of his enemies? And I think we will learn more about his experience in Jerusalem at the time he was taken into custody by the Romans by listening to Paul as he recalls it for Luke. Yes, Paul, I know how you were attacked by that mob of religious bigots while you were worshiping in the temple of Jerusalem, but I would like to learn more about it. Just how did you feel when it looked as though your enemies might almost literally tear you to pieces? Well, naturally, Luke, it's not an experience that one especially enjoys. However, I felt that somehow the Lord would deliver me from their hands. And he did. It was the Roman soldiers that actually delivered you from the hands of the mob, was it not? That is true. But this was one of the wonderful providences of the Lord. 
The Lord, you know, has various means of accomplishing his purposes. His holy angels serve as our guardians, but he can also employ Roman soldiers or other messengers, as seems best to him. I realize that, Paul. I have learned of one instance in which the Lord used our own brethren to let you down over a wall in a basket to enable you to escape from the hands of your religious enemies. But tell me some of the details of what happened after the Roman soldiers rescued you from the mob in the temple. You probably know that the soldiers bound me very securely with two chains, thinking, of course, that I must be a vicious criminal of some sort. Meanwhile, the crowd kept shouting charges against me, some crying one thing, some another. The chief captain was unable to learn just what the mob had against me, so he gave orders that I be taken into the castle for protection until an investigation could be made. Well, as I recall it, the Roman soldiers actually carried you on their shoulders to prevent the mob from getting their hands on you. That's right. And all the while, the excited crowd were crying, Away with him! Away with him! But just before they reached the inside of the castle, I asked the chief captain for permission to speak unto the people. At first, he thought I was an Egyptian outlaw who had previously caused trouble in the area. But when he learned that I was a Jew, he gave me permission to speak to the crowd. And then you told them about the time when you also persecuted Christians. And the wonderful manner in which the Lord had opened your eyes to the truth and that he had commissioned you to be a special apostle to the Gentiles. But, Luke, they didn't like that. When they heard the word Gentile, the crowd broke its silence and began once more to clamor for my life. Then the chief captain, supposing that I must have committed some grievous crime, ordered that I be scourged in order to force a confession from me. Then I simply asked if it was lawful to scourge a Roman citizen who had not been justly condemned before proper authorities. And that put an end to the scourging. The fact that you were born in Tarsus and automatically was thus a free citizen of Rome stood you in good stead more than once. But still, Paul, you were in a difficult position. I understand that a certain group of your enemies took a vow that they would not eat until they had killed you. That is correct. But the Lord assured me that all would be well. He said unto me, Be of good cheer, Paul, for thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem. So must you bear witness in Rome. I had felt reasonably sure for a long time that the Lord wanted me to go to Rome and preach the gospel there. And now I knew it. And I also knew that in his own way, the Lord would deliver me from the hands of my enemies in Jerusalem. But Paul, you did have an opportunity to appear before a group of religious leaders before you were taken out of Jerusalem. Well, that's true. And you know, it was rather amusing the way that that turned out. You see, some of those leaders were Pharisees and some were Sadducees. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead and in angels, while the Sadducees did not. So I said to this mixed group that I had been called in question concerning the resurrection of the dead. This was true. For one of the main things they had against me and against all Christians was that we taught that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead. And then what happened? Well, as I said, it was amusing. The Pharisees and the Sadducees started to argue among themselves, the Pharisees taking my side against the Sadducees. But even this became a little dangerous for me. So I was taken again into custody by the Roman soldiers for protection and later was spirited away from the city by a small army of soldiers to prevent my enemies taking my life, as a little band of them had vowed to do. You know, as I listened to Paul and Luke recall those bitter experiences in Jerusalem at the hands of religious bigots, it made me very thankful indeed that we live in the 20th century and in a country where there is religious tolerance. However, Russell, the spirit of hatred and persecution which manifested itself against Jesus and the apostles continued for many centuries. While the Roman government for a while protected Paul and other Christians against their persecutors, it also later got into the persecuting act, and thousands were put to death in the Colosseum in Rome and elsewhere for no other reason than that they were Christians. And persecution continued even after the downfall of pagan Rome. Unfortunately, there was a great deal of persecution on the part of one religious group against another. Yes, 
we can thank God that we are living in a more enlightened time. But to get back to Paul and Luke, when Paul was spirited out of Jerusalem, a letter was dispatched to the Roman governor Felix, putting the matter up to him as to what would be done with Paul. Is that not correct? It is. Uh, Felix was in Caesarea. He uh, received Paul, and upon uh, reading the letter sent to him by the chief captain in Jerusalem, ordered that his uh, prisoner be kept in Herod's judgment hall until his accusers arrived from Jerusalem. Well, I don't think we can do better than to listen to Paul and Luke as they discuss Paul's experiences when brought before Felix for trial. I believe, Paul, that you felt quite fortunate in having an opportunity to appear before Felix. He has the reputation of being better acquainted with Jewish traditions and viewpoints than did some of the Roman governors. His wife is a Jewess, is she not? That is correct. And from his attitude when he heard me speak, I have a feeling that he had a great deal of faith in our scriptures. On occasions, I could see that he actually trembled with emotion. A little conscience-stricken, perhaps, but, but impressed. Of course, your accusers, led by Ananias, the high priest who came from Jerusalem, really didn't have anything vital with which to charge you. No, Luke. Nothing at all. Oh, they trumped up some charges. They said that I was a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, a, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. They charged that I had profaned the temple in Jerusalem. But, of course, these were false charges. And in any case, in the eyes of the Roman government, would not be considered serious enough to warrant a death penalty. Mm. And being a lawyer yourself, you knew this. So your chief concern was not so much to defend yourself as it was to get a message of the gospel over to Felix and others who might be in his court. At the... And Luke, to testify the gospel of Christ, whether to kings or governors or anyone else, is the chief joy of my life. And I did have a grand opportunity to testify before Felix. Mm. Do you... Do you recall what you said to Felix? Very vividly, Luke. When Felix gave me the opportunity to speak for myself, I said to him, For as much as I know that thou hast been for many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Yes, Luke. I emphasize that the real issue was on this point of the resurrection, that it was touching the resurrection that I was being called in question. One would think that everybody in the world would be glad to be assured that there is to be a resurrection of the dead, but apparently that is not so. At least it was not so in Paul's day. Of course, Russell, there is another side to it. The Pharisees uh, did believe in the resurrection of the dead, but what they objected to was Paul's teaching that the resurrection was to be brought about through Jesus, and because he had first been raised from the dead. Their prejudice against Jesus blinded them to the glorious hope of the resurrection which their own prophets had foretold. And I noticed that the Apostle Paul, in his defense before Felix, indicated that the prophets of the Old Testament had foretold the resurrection of the dead. That's right. The word resurrection is not found in the Old Testament, but the hope of a resurrection to life conveyed by this word is clearly set forth. The prophet Job, for example, said that he expected that the Lord would call him forth from death. And Moses, in the 90th Psalm, foretold 
that the Lord would call upon the children of men to return from death. The Lord assured the prophet Daniel that those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And Russell, the Old Testament speaks of the dead as being uh, prisoners of death. And the hope of the resurrection is set forth in God's promises to release these prisoners from their captivity. These promises embrace the people of the Jewish nation as well as those of the various heathen nations. According to God's promises, even the uh, Sodomites are to be released from uh, their captivity and death. The prophet Ezekiel wrote that they will return to their former estate. That is interesting. But what is meant by the people being brought back to their former estate? It means that they will be restored to life right here on the earth as humans. Paul said to Felix, remember, that there is to be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. In the resurrection, the unjust will be enlightened concerning the will of God and given an opportunity to obey his laws. If they obey, they will live forever. Mr. Woodworth, Ed has emphasized that in the resurrection, the unjust will be restored to life on the earth. What about the righteous? Will they be taken to heaven in the resurrection? That will be true of the faithful followers of Jesus during the present age. These, Paul states in Romans chapter 2, verse 7, are to be exalted to glory, honor, and immortality. Jesus told his disciples that he was going away to prepare a place uh, for them and that he would uh, come again to receive them unto himself, that they might be with him. These are brought forth from death in what the Bible describes as the first resurrection, that they might live and reign with Christ during the thousand years of his kingdom here on earth. But what about all those righteous servants of God who lived and died prior to the coming of Jesus? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and many others. Ed, can you tell us where these will be when they are restored to life? The Bible reveals that they are to be restored to perfection of life right here on the earth, and that they will serve as human representatives of the divine Christ. The prophet David said of these that they will be made princes in all the earth. Paul speaks of them as being brought forth from death in a better resurrection. Their resurrection will be better than the resurrection of the unjust or unrighteous in that having proved their loyalty to God, they will immediately be given perfection of life. Well, I can see that the Bible has much to say about the resurrection. Certainly God's promises to restore the dead to life do hold out a glorious hope of life beyond the grave. And now I think it is time to listen in again to Paul and Luke as they discuss the apostles' experience in appearing before King Agrippa. Oh, to me it was really quite wonderful that the Roman authorities should have given you so many opportunities to testify on your own behalf. You spoke before Felix and Festus and finally before King Agrippa. That is true. And since one of the main issues was the resurrection of the dead, it afforded me good opportunities to witness to them concerning the glorious hope which is set before us and before the whole world, in the promises of God to restore the dead to life. And the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead by the mighty power of our God gives a very vital meaning to God's promises to restore all the dead to life. Quite true. Festus, as you know, asked if I would be willing to return to Jerusalem to face my accusers there. It was then that I appealed to Caesar, which was my right as a Roman citizen. It was this that resulted in my having an opportunity to appear before King Agrippa. Evidently, you made a good impression on Agrippa. For later, as you know, he said to Festus that had you not appealed your case to Caesar, you could have been set free. I know. But the Lord had revealed to me clearly that I was to go to Rome. And I knew that by appealing my case to Caesar, I would be taken there under the protection of the Roman government. 
So my appeal to Caesar seemed clearly to be the right thing to do. But tell me, Paul, about your testimony before King Agrippa. Well, as you know, the main point I wanted to impress upon the king's mind was the fact that God had promised to restore the dead to life. So I said to him that I was being judged for the hope of the promises made by God unto our fathers. Our twelve tribes hope to see the fulfillment of those promises. And it's for the very hope engendered by those promises that I was being accused by the Jews. Why, I asked the king, should it be thought a thing incredible that God should raise the dead? I understand that King Agrippa is quite well acquainted with our scriptures. Is that not true? Yes, it is. And I asked him straight out if he believed what the prophets had written. I told him, in fact, that I felt sure that he did believe. His reply astonished me somewhat. He said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. To this I replied, I would to God that not only thou, but all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I, uh, <clears throat> except these bonds. Evidently, King Agrippa was greatly impressed. You know, I like that question you asked the king. Should it be thought a thing incredible that God should raise the dead? Our God, the great creator of heaven and earth, is the one who gives life in the first place. Certainly he is able to restore life. We should have no doubt at all that he will restore life, for this is what he has promised to do. Yes, Luke. Not only has God promised to restore the dead to life, but he has guaranteed these promises by giving his own son to redeem humanity from death and has raised Jesus from the dead to be the first fruits of those who sleep in death. It's truly a joy to bear witness to such profound and glorious truths. Yes, it must have been a joy to the great apostle Paul to preach the gospel to kings and to everyone else. He wrote on one occasion, I remember, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, Mr. Woodworth, the Apostle Paul referred to those who are dead as being asleep in death. Isn't this the way the Bible describes the condition of the dead? Yes, Russell, it is. Those who are asleep will, in due course, awake from sleep. So will those who are dead, because... Divine power will be utilized to awaken them from the sleep of death. Those in natural uh, sleep are unconscious, and this also is true of those who have died. One of God's prophets wrote, The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. But uh, when uh, they are awakened from the sleep of death, they will again function as living beings. They will know themselves and know their friends and be reunited with them. Surely that is a bright prospect, a glorious hope of life beyond the grave. If such a hope were not firmly based upon the promises of God, we might very well say that it is too good to be true. But actually, Russell, when we begin to understand the glorious character of our God, especially his great love for the human race, we can say that nothing is too good for him to do on behalf of his human creatures. I agree with Paul that it should not be thought a thing incredible that God should raise the dead. In his letter to Christians in Corinth, Paul testified that God would raise the dead. I suggest that we listen while he repeats this testimony. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterwards them that are Christ's at his coming. Then 
cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Thank you, Paul, for those reassuring words concerning the victorious reign of Christ, when even death itself will be destroyed. Surely that is a bright prospect, especially when we realize that it will mean the awakening from death of all our friends and loved ones. And friends, it is this bright hope of the future which is presented in detail in this 96-page public service book entitled Hope Beyond the Grave, and you are invited to send for a copy. The subject matter of this little book is very comprehensive, as suggested in these chapter headings. What is death? Just what does happen to a person when he dies? All of us have wondered about this. What is heaven? Most Christians expect to share a home in heaven with Jesus. But what and where is heaven? This is one of the questions comprehensively discussed in the book Hope Beyond the Grave. Where is paradise? On the cross, Jesus spoke about being with the thief in paradise. What did he mean? Will we ever be with Jesus and the thief in paradise? One of the basic teachings of the Bible is the resurrection of the dead. What will the resurrection of the dead mean to you? Where will you be in the resurrection? Will you be with your friends? And will you know your friends in the resurrection? These questions are all satisfyingly answered in the 96-page book, Hope Beyond the Grave. So send now for your free copy. To view the booklet online, visit www.dawnbible.com or to receive a hard copy of the booklet by mail, send us your name and postal mailing address and ask for the booklet by name. The title of the booklet for this program is Hope Beyond the Grave. Send an email to dawnbible at aol.com. The booklet will be mailed to you free and without obligation. And now, goodbye, and may God bless you.